All right, so good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. For those joining us for the first time, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. Right now, we are joined by over seven classes live from across North America and dozens more on YouTube, which is really exciting. So I'm going to give them a chance to do a bit of a shout out before we get underway. We've got Miss Evans, grade sixes in Haynes, Oregon. Hi, guys. <laughs> Always punching above their weight with excitement. We've got Miss Foster's grade sixes in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. Hi, guys. I haven't had a class in Tuscaloosa before. This is very exciting. Uh, we've got Miss Eagles grade fives in San Antonio, Texas. Hi, guys. Oh, volume's not there, but they're there, and they're excited. We've got Miss Lackey's grade fives in Freehold, New Jersey. Hi, guys. Hi. We've got Mr. Cryer and the whole gang in Spruce Grove, Alberta. Looks like the entire town. Hi, guys. <laughs> awesome. We've got Ms. Demi Nacos's great fours in Ottawa, Ontario. <laughs> Last but not least, Ms. Mayor's great fours in Calgary, Alberta. Hi, guys. Awesome. Okay. Of course, the reason you guys are all here today is for our speaker. So we are joined live in Toronto, where I am as well, by George Karunas, who is one of the foremost explorers in the entire world. He has been to every continent numerous times, dove into volcanoes, chased hurricanes, hosted Angry Planet, is Canada's chair of the Explorers Club, and too many other accolades to mention. Without further ado, uh, we look forward to hearing more about your work and getting excited on your adventures. George, thanks so much for joining us. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jesse. Hi, everyone. It's great to be here again on uh, Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants, uh, sharing some of my adventures with all of you today from all over North America. So much fun. So as Jesse was saying, I'm an explorer. That is my job. It seems kind of strange that that is actually a job that you can have, but it is. And I don't go and discover new continents. That all happened hundreds of years ago. But what I do is I travel around the world and I document extreme forces of nature. So I've got a few photos to show you guys just to give you an idea of what it is I do. Let me get the screen share happening here. And I should be able to now pull this up. Is that working, Jesse? Not yet, still you. You're very handsome. Oh, well, I don't know about that. <laughs> oh, here we go. I have to hit the share button. Yeah, that, that makes it work fine. There you go. Can you guys see that? Perfect. Awesome. Great. So I'll, I figure I'll show you some pictures as opposed to just looking at my face, even though Jesse says I am handsome. I don't know. <laughs> the check's in the mail, Jesse. Thank you. So I literally travel to, I've been to about 70 countries now, uh, based in Toronto and documenting extreme weather, storms, natural disasters, things like that. Lightning striking the CN Tower here in Toronto is one of my favorite things to photograph. Uh, each bolt of lightning can be a hundred million volts and burn five times hotter than the surface of the sun. So it's just so much power coming down from, from the sky. It's just absolutely beautiful and brilliant. Uh, going into hurricanes, about 20 of them now over the years. This is one from Bermuda, but I've also been chasing hurricanes in Atlantic Canada, the Caribbean. Florida, Texas, up and down the eastern seaboard, all over. And the idea when I'm documenting a hurricane is to try and get as close to that calm eye in the middle. But to get to that calm eye, you have to basically ride out the strongest, most violent part of the storm. And here you can see it whipping up the, the sea here in uh, Bermuda. So that's probably not the best place to stand. <laughs> but uh, just went out there for a couple of quick minutes to... Uh, just to sort of sample the waves there and then uh, duck back to safety. But also volcanoes. This is one of my favorite volcanoes in the world. Uh, this giant pit of a, a crater in the South Pacific island nation of Vanuatu, where there's this lake of boiling lava, and it is just unbelievably beautiful. To get down to that spot, I had to rappel down on ropes that uh, dropped me down into the crater as deep as a skyscraper building is tall, and then able to walk right up to the edge of this violently boiling lava to document it and show people the forces that are involved in how land is created here on Earth, right? All the land that we stand on had to come from somewhere, and a lot of it comes from these volcanic processes. 
Um, this lake of lava no longer exists. A couple of months ago, there was a big eruption and the whole lava lake drained and the crater is filled in and the spot where our base camp used to be set up is now gone. It no longer exists. So it's uh, proof that the earth is dynamic. It's always changing. And I like to be there when it's changing, but I certainly would not have wanted to have been sleeping in my tent when the whole crater collapsed. So we try to do things as safely as possible. I must say in all these years, not a single broken bone, not a single overnight stay in hospital. And that's what it looks like at the bottom of this crater. The suit that I'm wearing protects me from the extreme heat. I'm wearing a gas mask that protects me from the poisonous gases that are uh, that come out of these volcanoes, sulfur gases type things like that. So it's almost like going to another planet. It really is quite incredible. Um, but not just hot places. I spend a lot of time going to cold places as well. Some places that are very, very cold. Just a couple of months ago, I was in Antarctica, one of the most beautiful, pristine wilderness spots in the world. But of course, due to climate change, the ice is melting. It's changing very rapidly. The Arctic and Antarctic regions are experiencing temperature changes that are double what we're seeing in other parts of the world. So in this picture, we've got this beautiful, beautiful blue ice of this glacier that's coming down from the mountains down to the ocean edge, and uh, these glaciers break off. It's called calving, and this causes gigantic icebergs to go floating around. So we were navigating around these icebergs. It's, it's very beautiful, but sort of difficult to navigate around. And of course, the local residents didn't seem to care too much about us. We saw thousands upon thousands upon thousands of penguins down there. And I must say, they're very cute, but they're kind of smelly. When you're downwind of a penguin colony, it's a, it's kind of gross, but they are so cute. And, and right now they're raising their, uh, their chicks for, uh, you know, they, they laid their chicks back in November, and now the chicks are starting to grow up, and pretty soon they'll be heading out into the water to go uh, start fishing for themselves. But while I was down there, it wasn't just to photograph it or, or document it, we also did a live hangout from down there at uh, Port Lockroy Station. This is an old British Antarctic base. And that yellow device down at the bottom is a satellite broadcasting terminal that I brought down with me to Antarctica. And we did one of these Google Hangouts from Antarctica live. It was amazing, so very cool. Uh, the technology that exists now, the early explorers could have only, only dreamed of. But tornadoes is really where I got my start. Uh, these tornadoes are these violently rotating columns of air that are in contact with the ground. They're part of these large thunderstorms. And the storms that produce these tornadoes can be up to twice the height of Mount Everest. That's absolutely huge. These storms are the size of cities. And sometimes they spin. And as they spin, they can form these tornadoes. And as a matter of fact, there was a tornado outbreak just yesterday. And I know one of the classes is from Alabama. And here's a map of the tornadoes that uh, touched down yesterday across parts of Florida, Alabama, Georgia, uh, the deep south there. So it's that time of year. We're getting into storm season. The United States gets about 75% of all the tornadoes in the world. And they usually happen in the central part of America, in Texas, Oklahoma, Kansas, Nebraska, those kind of spots. But sometimes, especially early in the season, like we have now, where it's February, March, they happen in the southeast. And they can be extremely violent. Unfortunately, yesterday, uh, some of these tornadoes hit towns, and there, there were a number of fatalities, unfortunately. So what I try to do is forecast where I think these tornadoes are going to be, drive to where I think they're going to happen, and then wait for the storms to form, and then try to chase them, film them, photograph them. And if we see a tornado that's about to touch down, we'll uh, let the authorities know so that all the towns that are in the path of these tornadoes can be warned so that people can get to their basement or they can hide to try and protect themselves from these tornadoes. But some of them, some of them are small and 
sort of look like elephant trunks coming out of the sky or, or like a needle or uh, a stove pipe. But some of them are just big. This, these wedge shaped tornadoes that come down that can have wind speeds that are so strong that they could take your car and lift it and throw it into the next field. They can take entire well-built homes and strip them down to the, to the concrete foundation. And that's just wind doing that. It's unbelievable how powerful these forces can be. And this particular tornado was a world record width. It was, let me think here, it was 2.6 miles wide, which in metric is about 4.3 kilometers. Absolutely massive. And it, it didn't even look like a tornado. It looked like a smudge across the landscape. So this is definitely the kind of uh, storm that you want to avoid. Um, if there's a tornado warning for your area, get to the basement, get to a safe place. If you don't have a basement, get into the bathroom, maybe climb into the bathtub. That's a relatively safe spot, right? But uh, I travel all over trying to pursue and document these. And it's been uh, about 20 years now of doing this in uh, in Canada and, and the US and Australia, a bunch of different, different places. Now I've had, um, a lot of experiences where tornadoes have come very close to where we were. This particular tornado crossed the road right in front of us. And it was producing winds that were so strong that when I opened the car door, everything that was in my car got sucked out of it. Like all of my maps and the GPS unit, everything got pulled out by the tornado and it crossed the road maybe less than 100 meters or less than 100 yards right ahead of us just on the other side of the house in that photograph and we're just starting to learn now the connection between climate change and tornadoes um, it looks like there's a connection between arctic sea ice in canada and tornadoes in the rest of north america it looks like the less sea ice there is the fewer tornadoes there may be. This is going to require some more study, but it certainly looks like there's a, a relationship between the two. And we're just now, just this past year, starting to understand that relationship. Now, I had a request. One of the teachers sent me a, a message on Twitter asking about a particular expedition that I was on to the Brazilian Amazon rainforest. So I've got a few pictures here for you guys to show that because I don't normally talk about this expedition when I'm giving talks. And this was really interesting. So I explore extreme places. The Amazon rainforest is absolutely an extreme place. It has one of the highest biodiver biodiversities in the world, meaning there's lots of different species of plants, animals, insects, birds, fish. And just over 100 years ago, back in 1913, the former president of the United States, Theodore Roosevelt, did an expedition to map a river in the Amazon. At the time, they nicknamed this river the River of Doubt because people didn't know where the river went. They knew it somehow connected to the Amazon River, but they didn't know exactly. So when Roosevelt was finished with his uh, presidency, he did an expedition down there with um, Brazilian explorer uh, Candido Rondon. And the two of them teamed up and they spent uh, the better part of a year traveling down this river. And I did a recreation of this a number of years ago. I actually traveled to this river and followed their path for a short section of the river. And let me tell you, it is full of perils. There are giant tarantulas, there's venomous snakes, there are giant caiman. This is not an alligator, actually. It's a caiman. It looks like an alligator. It's a relative of alligators and crocodiles, but it's a caiman. But if one of them is trying to bite you, the name is not so important. But uh, we saw quite a few of these down there. And it's not just these. You've got giant piranhas, some of the biggest piranhas I've ever seen. And of course, the rapids. The, the, the river itself is extremely treacherous. And while President Roosevelt was doing this expedition, they had so many problems with sickness, with injuries. 
he almost uh, died from an injury to his leg that got infected. Uh, one of the members of the team drowned in the river in part of, it might have even been this set of rapids right here. Uh, there was a murder on the expedition. One of the members murdered one of the others. And then the, the murderer himself was left behind by the expedition team to fend for himself. No one ever knows exactly what happened to him. So all of these things were just problems that this expedition had. And I wanted to go there and sort of recreate some of these uh, things that they, that they were doing down there and look for one of the actual boats from the expedition. We heard that there was one of Roosevelt's boats that was nearby, that was basically buried in the sand along the riverbed, but we searched and searched. We had metal detectors. We had all kinds of maps and electronics with us, but we were unable to find it, unfortunately. So maybe I need to go back. I'm not sure, but uh, certainly was one of the most uh, wild expeditions I've been on. Let me turn my screen sharing off here. There, I think that's off now. So there's just a real quick example of some of the many different types of expeditions that I go on as a professional explorer. And what it all really comes down to is preparation and research. I do a lot of reading to understand what it is I'm going to go see. The more I understand, the safer I will be. Um, so that is absolutely critical. And so I really encourage you, if you're interested in something, I read so many books about this kind of stuff when I was a kid. Ocean exploring books from Jacques Cousteau. It just goes on and on and on. So. I know that's a lot of information to throw at you guys all at once about tornadoes and volcanoes and the Amazon rainforest, but I want to make sure that we have a lot of time to answer a bunch of questions. So I think I'm going to pass it back to Jesse to try and moderate some questions. How does that sound, Jess? That sounds great. Thank you so, so much, George. That was great. And for classes that might have joined for George's before, we've never done one on River of Doubt. So thank you to Ms. Foster's class for typing that in and, and asking you on Twitter, because that's awesome. Uh, before we start with the classes live, I want to note we've got 10 groups watching on YouTube live right now. So if you want to type questions in your chat bar, please do. I will pass them on. Don't be shy. But with that said, let's start with Ms. Evans' class. If hey, you guys have a question, kick us off. Go right ahead. What kind of schooling did you have to do? So great question. What kind of schooling did I have to do? Well, I originally studied music in university, and then I switched to engineering, and I spent many years working as an engineer building recording studios for a living. But then I took everything that I learned doing that and started applying it to doing expeditions and into photography. So I'm partially trained as an engineer, well, fully trained as an engineer, but all of the storm chasing I had to learn from other people, other experts, uh, a lot of reading. So a lot of the stuff that I do, there's no school for. There's no explorer school that you can go and study at. So most of it was done on my own on top of the engineering education that I already had. Awesome. Quick follow-up before the second class. So when did you start I think there's an assumption with a lot of classes that people need to start this when they're really young. So when you did your first expedition, how old were you? Yeah, I did my first tornado chase when I was 28 years old. Okay. So my career has changed many times over the years. And when I was your age, I had no idea that I would be doing what I'm doing now. I didn't even know that it was possible to do what I'm doing now. So you just never know what you're gonna be able to do if you just set your mind to it. I just got so focused, I wanted to do this. The purpose of my life was to travel the world, document these places, and share what I've seen with as many people as possible. And that has a lot of power. Very cool. Uh, all right, Ms. Foster's class, if you guys have a question, come on up. You should be good to go. There we go. Yep. We have been learning about President Roosevelt in class. What did you learn by following his steps on the Rio Roosevelt River? Yeah, what I really learned is those guys were tough. They didn't have all of the, the technology that we had. They, had to, they built their own boats out of logs that they found there. Uh, they made a lot of mistakes during the expedition. They didn't bring proper food. The boats were too heavy. Uh, so definitely they could have prepared a lot better for the expedition. But when you think about it, it was over 100 years ago. So they didn't have the modern materials that we have these days. They didn't have Gore-Tex. They didn't have carbon fiber like we have now. There was no GPS. There was no satellite internet. There was no Google. There was none of that existed. 
So in order for them to do what they did, and for me to go and sample just a small piece of it, really gives me a lot of respect for what they were able to accomplish and how they persevered through the hardships was mind blowing. Outstanding. Uh, we got our first question online. So Ethan Miss Caesars class wanted to know what's the biggest challenge you face. You're talking about all these challenges that Teddy Roosevelt faced for you personally. Yeah, probably the the biggest challenge I ever had was during an expedition to a country called Turkmenistan, which is in Central Asia. It's near Iran. I did a project for National Geographic there about five years ago, and it was just nonstop problems, logistics. I had to go inside a giant flaming crater. It's called Darvaza. I'm not going to talk too much about it today because that is a whole and other entire lecture in and of itself. But it took almost two years worth of planning and preparation for me to be able to go into that country and set foot at the bottom of this flaming crater for only 17 minutes. So it was a lot of trouble and a lot of preparation for just so little time. Excellent. Uh, I know you can't dive into it today. I just want to urge the classes, do look up George's website. You'll see pictures and, and documentation of that. He's the only person in human history to ever be at the bottom of that crater, which is very, very neat. I'm um, looking at the Guinness certificate above my office right now. There you go. <laughs> Miss Eagles class, if you guys have a question, come on up. Oh, you should be, are you guys demuted or is it, okay. If your mic's not working, Miss Eagles class wants to ask, what's the most dangerous situation you've been in? I don't Yeah, um, I've had lightning strike so close that I've felt the heat on my face and seen the sparks flying up off the ground. Um, I had a tornado one time push a piece of farm equipment, one of those irrigation structures that they use for watering uh, crops, into my car and smash the windshield uh, while I was driving it as the tornado formed right beside us. So that was certainly uh, dangerous. I've had to dodge pieces of lava flying through the air where you stop and watch the angle, the trajectory of the lava flying through the air, and you have to watch and sort of duck out of the way. So there's been quite a few close calls over the years, but as I said before, I'm very happy. All my fingers, all my toes, no broken bones. We try to do dangerous things in as safe a manner as possible. Safety is always our number one priority. I want to keep doing this for many, many years. Okay. Thank you uh, for your concern. Yeah. <laughs> Um, Miss Lackey's class, if you guys have a question. Go ahead. Yeah. We are learning about your Indian explorers. They don't have much technology. As a modern explorer, which type of technology is most important and why? Oh, really great question. So what kind of technology is most important and why as a modern explorer? So I'm going to have to say there's two real big ones now that make my life so much better. Uh, GPS navigation. There are now satellites surrounding the Earth that I can literally take a small GPS unit anywhere on the planet, know exactly where I am, know exactly where I need to be. And satellite-based internet technology is another big one. I can be on a volcano in the, in the middle of Africa, and I can check my emails, I can do live streaming events, I can be just like in my office at home, but anywhere in the world. So that helps me to be safe. It helps me to communicate with my team all over the world. And it allows me to share these things in real time, kind of like what we're doing right now. So those two things, satellite internet and GPS. Very cool. Um, Ms. Anderson's group online wants to know, what's the most, what's the most scared you've ever been? Is one of their questions. <laughs> I was in a cave in Kenya, in Africa one time, and I was bitten by a bat in this cave. And the cave is known for uh, having an Ebola type virus there. So I didn't know if I caught this virus from the bat that bit through the glove I was wearing. And so I spent about five days not knowing if my internal organs were going to turn to liquid. So that was uh, unsettling to say the least. <laughs> to say the least. <laughs> to say the least. Yeah. But I was uh, okay. I was fine. <laughs> we're glad. We <laughs> Me too. Uh, all right. We're going to take two questions actually in a row from the one class just because they seem, again, Spruce Grove, you guys have so many kids. So let's Bring take it. one guys and then we'll come right back and take another one. So 
Go right ahead, guys. Can you hear us? Yep. You're good. Okay, hey, Kaylee. Um, have you ever had like any sea creatures or anything like mythical and cool? So I suppose what, what is one? That. That. Sorry, go ahead. I think we yeah, just, I just couldn't make that out. Sea creature? Have you seen any sea creatures or been around any sea creatures? Or oh, absolutely, yeah, lots of interesting sea creatures. I've done a lot of scuba diving over the years. I've been a diver since I was 19 years old, and uh, I've been diving with great white sharks. Uh, I have been stung by a box jellyfish, the most venomous creature on, on planet Earth. Uh, that was in Australia. Um, lots of really interesting things. What I would love to see with my own eyes at some point is a giant squid. I would love to see that. Maybe one of these days. Okay. Uh, we're going right back to Spruce Grove, and I want to confirm that that was the question, and then you can ask a second one, too. So let's just make sure. Was that the question? Yeah, that was the question. Okay, come on up for a second. <laughs> come on, uh, and be really loud, okay? Um, have you, what's like the most dangerous thing you've ever done? I or anything like you see in that you didn't really expect to see where you were at. Yeah. So the most dangerous thing you've ever done or something where like it wasn't, you didn't expect something to happen that did, that jumps to mind. You said a few, but... Yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll combine those two into one answer, actually. Uh, that volcano I showed you the photo of, the one where we had to rappel down 1,200 feet or 400 meters down to the very bottom, uh, just being down there was extremely dangerous because it, there are earthquakes all the time. And when it's time to climb up out of the volcano, we have to use these special ascenders that are basically like a lawnmower engine that, you, that is attached to a special pulley. You clip it to your climbing harness, thread the rope through it, start up the engine, and then you use it to help you climb up the side. But of course, there are rocks that are falling. That is, that's actually the most dangerous part of being inside a volcano. It's not the lava. It's actually rocks tumbling down the side. So while I was down there one time getting ready to climb up out of the volcano, I go to start the engine, and the pull cord to start the engine breaks and comes off in my hand. And now I'm stuck. 1,200 feet down inside the bottom of an active volcano. Luckily, it started on that first pull, and I was able to get out of the crater. <laughs> now, I wouldn't have been trapped because we, had, we have backup plans. We have emergency contingency plans. So we had spare machines. I had people up top ready to help me, but I would have been trapped down there for an, quite a few hours. So. Luckily, again, everything worked out just fine, but we plan for these kind of things. We try to never be too surprised by anything, and that really goes a long way. All right, that actually ties into a question we just got online uh, from Ms. Uh, Colburn's class, which is how long does it take to prepare for an expedition, typically? Yeah. If there's a typical answer for that. Yeah, that's a, that's, a, that's a great question as well. You guys are so full of great questions today. This is amazing. So in my basement, I have all of my equipment organized into these giant tubs. Scuba diving equipment, volcano equipment, hurricane, rain equipment, all that, all, everything. So I can be ready to go in a matter of minutes. I could be on my way to the airport in less than half an hour with all of my stuff packed and ready to go if an emergency comes up. But sometimes it takes a year, a year and a half, sometimes almost two years of planning and preparation if it's a really complicated expedition, like the fire pit in Turkmenistan, or, um, well, the, pardon me, there's a number of different expeditions that have been really complicated that require getting permissions from governments, applying for permits, and all of that kind of stuff is what takes a long time. Okay. Before we do our last two questions in our first round, I just want to note for classes, uh, scuba diving has been mentioned a few times, and we really like to note that kids can sign up to become scuba divers at 10 years old. So once you're 10, you can do that. It opens up 70% of the world for exploration to you. Probably no greater skill you can have to, to get on a path like George. Highly recommend it. Awesome. All right. Uh, Mrs. Danny Nakos' class, who we finally got your mic working, which I love. So let's do it. <laughs> What's the most beautiful place you've went to? Oh, the most beautiful place I've went to. I wish I had a picture. Uh, you know what? I'm going to pull up a picture. Um, it's the, a cave in Mexico called the Nica Crystal Cave. And there are um, 
crystals inside this cave that are like tree trunks. They are absolutely huge. And I'm just going to hold up a picture here right now to show you guys. See if you can see that. That's me in the middle. And those crystals are huge. It looks like something from another planet. And uh, I was able to go there for about a day and a half a number of years ago, and it took two years to get permission to go here. And those crystals, some of them are 10 meters long or 30 feet long and weigh 55 tons. And it is one of the most beautiful places. But the air temperature is so hot in this cave, it's about 52 Celsius or 120, about 125 degrees Fahrenheit. So the suits that we're wearing had to be filled with ice so that we could keep our body core temperature down. And we had to breathe chilled air from a special backpack that we were wearing. So a lot of really expensive, specialized equipment just to be able to go in there for about 40 minutes at a time. Really incredible, but so beautiful. Very cool. I'm surprised you had an answer for that most beautiful place you've ever been. Given all oh, your hands time. down. It's the most beautiful place on earth. I okay. <laughs> um, Ms. Mayor's class, if you guys want to uh, have a question, come on up. And you're good to go. Yeah, never. Okay. Um, where is the hardest place you ever been to? Like, the volcano, how hot was it? The hottest place? And how hot was it? Like a volcano, George. Wow. Okay, well, it sort of depends. So I've been inside that cave was about uh, 52 Celsius or 120 some odd degrees Fahrenheit, but lava can be about 1500 degrees. And when you're standing close to lava, it's almost impossible to describe how hot it is. If you've ever opened the oven while it's been on and you get that blast of heat, it's like that, but even hotter. Like I have lit my boots on fire stepping on fresh lava. And I've, I've got uh, small burns where my special protective suit, where there's been a little gap between my glove and my sleeve, and just that little bit of my arm has received burns just from being close to the lava for a few moments. So it's, uh, it, it's really unlike anything that you would experience near a fire. Just lava is so much, so much hotter. All right. Uh, guys, so we, we're ripping through these. Thanks, George, for stopping early so we could have extra time for questions. We have time for a whole other round, and we'll see how it goes from there. Bring it. But, yeah, so Miss Evans' class, if you guys have a second question, yeah. come on up. If you couldn't do this job, what would you do? If I couldn't do this job, I would, well, I, uh, I originally started my career studying music. And I still play music now. I, I was actually doing a recording session just yesterday. So that's one of my hobbies. And so if I couldn't do exploration, then I would probably try to be uh, a musician. Okay. Um, Ms. Foster's class, do you guys have another question? Come on up. We have learned about radiation exposure in our class. What precautions did you take when visiting Chernobyl? Ah, oh, you guys have been doing your research. This is great. <laughs> I love it when classes do their research on me before uh, we do these sessions. They pull up all these questions that, that I have, didn't even talk about. So let me just give you a bit of reference. A few years ago, I was filming an episode of the Angry Planet TV show, and we did that in the country of Ukraine, where Chernobyl is. And back in 1986, there was an explosion at the nuclear power plant there, and there was a fire, and there was all kinds of radiation. The um, the entire population of the nearby city of Pripyat, which had about 50,000 people, I believe, had to be immediately evacuated. And the city is still radioactive to this day. So we were able to go and basically document this place. But it was so radioactive that we had to have a special machine, a radiometer, we call it, like kind of like a Geiger counter. Some people call it a Geiger counter, but it's really a radiometer. and we could measure how much radiation there was in different parts of the city. We had a special guide with us who knew the place, and there were certain areas of the city where we were not even allowed to stop. And there were other places where we were only allowed to stay for about 15 minutes, and we had a little timer that was running. So it's like, okay, we can stay here for 15 minutes, the clock is ticking, do your filming, get your photos, do what you gotta do, and then we gotta get out of there. We didn't have to have any specialized clothing or protective equipment because we didn't stay that long. But when we were leaving the area, 
going through one of the checkpoints, we had to get scanned by this special machine. And it scans your hands, it scans your feet to see if you picked up any kind of radioactive dust. Because you don't really want to touch anything when you're there. Radiation, you can't see it, you can't smell it, you can't really detect it without special equipment. So you don't even know that you're being poisoned by this, these you know, radioactive elements. So it was a really interesting place because the city has been abandoned for decades. So there's trees growing up to the sidewalk and, and all the windows are busted out. And it's just it's like this abandoned city. Very, very creepy, but super, super cool. Super cool. And again, thanks to the classes for doing research and for some really thoughtful, great questions today. You guys are doing awesomely. Um, all right, Ms. Eagles class, if you guys have a, oh, you guys have the, there we go. Is there, <laughs> sorry, no mic. Is there a place you have not gone that you would like to visit? <laughs> Everywhere. So many. <laughs> I, I have a huge map of the world up on my uh, wall right now, and it's full of pins of all the places that I've been to. And any place where there is not a pin is a place I want to go to. But more specifically, uh, I, I really want to go to Japan. I've never been to Japan. They get typhoons. They have active volcanoes. They get tsunamis. They get earthquakes. They get everything. I really want to go there. And there's one volcano in Antarctica called Mount Erebus. It's on a place called Ross Island. And it also has a lake of lava. And it's one of the only ones in the world that I have not been to yet. It's very difficult, it's very cold, uh, it's expensive. There's all these things that are make it difficult to go there, but it's number one on my bucket list, Mount Erebus. Okay. Uh I have a question that I wanted to ask based on traveling in general. When you do you ever go on a vacation? So you, you do these expeditions for a living. Yeah. If you travel just for fun, where do you go? And do you do that at all? The last, like, I travel between 100 to 220 nights a year. Depends how busy I am. The last time I went on a vacation was about two years ago, and I went mountain climbing in North Korea. That was my, <laughs> that was my vacation. <laughs> so I, I, I don't really do vacations the way normal people do. <laughs> Uh, that, yeah, that story explains it all. Uh, Ms. Laggy's class, if you guys have a question, uh, come on up. Because of global warming, are storms becoming more severe? Are storms becoming more severe? Yeah. Yeah, so what we're seeing with climate change and global warming is we're seeing changes in the weather patterns, right? So these once every hundred year storms are now happening once every 10 years, or these once every 10 year storms are happening once every two years. So we're getting more of these extreme events. We're getting more flooding, more rains in some places. We're getting more drought and less rain in other places. The thing I can uh, get concerned about, one of the things I get concerned about is storms, specifically storms like hurricanes, because the fuel for hurricanes is warm ocean water. That's where they draw their energy from. Whenever a hurricane passes over really warm ocean water, it gets stronger. If it goes over cold water, it weakens. Now, that incoming radiation from the sun, that heat that we feel on a nice warm day, likes to heat up dark objects, right? If you wear a black t-shirt, it's hotter outside than if you're wearing a white t-shirt because it absorbs all that, that heat, right? Well, the ocean's pretty dark, so it absorbs a lot of that incoming heat. And as the oceans warm, we're worried that there's going to be more fuel for stronger hurricanes. So that's something that really could be um, a major factor for cities like Miami, New York, uh, any city that's on, on the coastline, right? So certainly it, it is a concern, and we're seeing those kind of uh, hints already. Mm hmm um, all right, let's head to Spruce Grove. If you guys have a third question, come on up. You're good. Have been to Mount St. Helens? Have I been to Mount St. Helens? No, no, I haven't. As a matter of fact, I've been to 48 of the 50 U.S. states. There's only two I haven't been to yet. Oregon is one of them, and I've got plans to go there later this year, hopefully. And Washington, which is where Mount St. Helens is. I remember the eruption of Mount St. Helens when I was a kid. I was only about 10 years old when it, when it happened. And of course I was fascinated by it. And in all of these years of all of these volcanoes all over the world, I still have not been to Mount St. Helens. So I'm thinking maybe that's going a little higher on my bucket list 
of all the, of the, the places I want to go sooner rather than later, because I would love to see it. Mount St. Helens was a very unique volcanic eruption in that it exploded out of the side of the volcano, not out of the top. When it erupted, there was the largest landslide ever recorded. Basically, almost half of the mountain slid away, and that released a whole bunch of pressure that was holding in the volcano. Basically, these gases that come out of the volcano, if the lava is very sticky, it holds that pressure in. If the lava is very fluid, then the gases come out very easily. So that sticky lava holds the gas, the pressure builds up, until the side of the mountain slipped away, releasing that pressure, and then just exploded out the side of the volcano and caused this massive blast that flattened everything for miles around. Really interesting, from a geological perspective. Well, here's hoping you get there soon. Hopefully. Uh, quick question from a group online before we do our last two here. So Ms. Colburn wants to know, from your first expedition, what was it, how memorable was it? Like, do you really recall that first tornado chase? Absolutely, I remember it. Oh, wow. <laughs> it was the last two weeks of May 1998. I traveled down to Oklahoma and met up with some experienced storm chasers. These guys have been doing it for years. Legends, really. And I, I had the opportunity to spend two weeks with these guys. And the weather wasn't really cooperating that much. We were down to only having a few days left before I had to go home. Saw a lot of great storms, but still hadn't seen a tornado yet. Then we're in north central Oklahoma near this town called Medford, little tiny place. No one's ever heard of it. And tornado touches down. We can see it. It's in the field right beside us. And it starts moving towards us. So we need to get out of the way. Problem is, it had been raining a lot. We're turning around in our van. And we get stuck in the ditch a little bit as we're trying to turn around to get out of there. And the tornado is still coming towards us. So course it was very uh, the adrenaline was pumping we managed to pull out get out of the way and the tornado crossed the road right where we had been stopped and it just so happens by total coincidence we had a tv crew traveling with us they, they managed it was a tv crew from national geographic as a matter of fact and they were traveling with us just for a few days and they happened to be with us on that day when that happened so my very first tornado was documented for a National Geographic TV show. So that was super cool. Once, I, once that happened, then that's it. I'm hooked ever since. Awesome. I think the classes can join me in being astonished that you have never spent a night in the hospital or broken a bone with all the stories you've told us today. But kudos to you. <laughs> yeah, well, never spent a night in hospital from any, of my, from any injury ever received on, a, on an expedition. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> we'll dive in there. I, I'm as I'm as amazed by it, you know, as anyone else. But again, it's my training, it's my research and experience that helps to keep me safe. If I were to try and fly an airplane, I would crash it because I don't know what I'm doing. If you put me in a volcano or you put me near a storm, I know what's going on. I can look at it. I can tell you what's happening. Is the storm strengthening? Is it weakening? Which way is it moving? Is it likely to produce a tornado or not? because I've been doing it for 20 years, right? Mm -hmm. A pilot can sit behind the controls of a plane and fly it no problem because they've been doing it for 20 years. So it's all about what you know and your experience and your training and your studies. Preparation is something that we get in a lot of our hangouts, so I appreciate that message. Um, all right, last two questions. I know we're getting to the end of periods, guys. So Miss Demianakos' Demi class, if you guys have another question, come on up. Yeah. Yep, you're good. What's the coolest place you've been in Canada? The coldest place I've been in Canada? No, the no. coolest. Well, oh, the coolest place. Well, they're pretty much the same, actually. <laughs> um, I've, I've been up to the Arctic a, a few times, and uh, it is so beautiful up there through the Northwest Passage, Baffin Island. Uh, I was camping on Baffin Island in minus 35 temperatures, I believe it was, maybe wind chill of minus 40, with the northern lights overhead. You get out of your tents, and you're, you're camping in a frozen fjord. You get out of your tent and you look up and the whole sky is dancing green with the northern lights. And it's just one of the most spectacular things that you can witness. I, I really hope that every Canadian uh, gets a chance to go up and see the northern parts of Canada. The communities are so friendly. The landscapes are incredibly beautiful. Awesome. Uh, thanks for the Canadian question, guys. Uh, and then we'll wrap it up with Ms. Mayor's class. If you guys have a last question, 
You look like you're demuted, but I'm not really sure. You might need to demute your own mic, but just come on up, and it's the little microphone symbol top of your screen. If. We'll see how it's going. I don't know why. Nope. So now you're muted. Unmute it, and we'll see what's going on. Let's. You should be good. Try now. Yep. Oh, come a little closer to the computer. Did you have to learn any languages? In any language? uh, yeah. Did you have to learn any languages, George? Did I have to learn any languages? Wow, that's a great question. Um, I, sp I speak English. I speak a little bit of French. Um, I can speak enough Spanish to, like, get by and order something in a restaurant as long as they're not talking too quickly. Uh, that's one of the skills that I uh, wish I had is the ability to speak more languages than I do. And I tell you, it's interesting. Being able to speak a little bit of French really comes in handy in places like Africa. There are lots of African nations where they speak French. So that has come in handy when traveling to that part of the world, for sure. Very cool. Merci beaucoup. <laughs> Before we wrap up, George, is there any last message you want to share with classes about how they can get involved in exploration, learn more about your exploits or anything else? Yeah, I, I just want to thank you guys for coming out today and, and allowing me to share some of these uh, stories with you. Um, if you want to learn more, what I showed you today was maybe less than 1% of all the different explorations and expeditions from all over the world. Uh, you can go to furiousearth.com. Um, there's, there's all kinds of videos on YouTube. Just search for my name if you want to see some clips of some of the old TV shows that I've done, things like that. Uh, just enjoy your curiosity and just... If you're interested in something, just research it like crazy. And the more you know, the more you can do. It's just so much fun to be able to get out there and share these stories with young people. I love it. Thank you. Outstanding. Uh, you highlighted that you did a hangout from Antarctica too. So for our classes, in case you don't know, these all broadcast right to YouTube. You can watch George in Antarctica live from uh, a couple months ago too. So do check that out. Uh, George, as you know, at the end of every hangout, what we do, I'm going to demute every class's microphone. So if you guys, boys and girls, can join me in saying a huge thank you to George for joining us today. Everyone is being yeah. yeah. Awesome, guys. Love the enthusiasm. We look forward to having you back. Edward, amazing as always, and uh, hope to have you back soon. Thank you so much.